right, thank you everybody for joining us this afternoon. Um, we are here to talk about buildings and land trust ownership of buildings and headquarters and construction and all the good things that come along with buildings. Um, I'm very pleased and grateful to our uh, co-presenters who are joining me today. We have Will Keyes from the Greenwich Land Trust, Mike Kavim from Joshua's Trust, and Christina White from Lime Land Trust, all of whom have different buildings that their land trusts manage and use, or um, in one case are in the process of building one of those. So um, excited to hear these different perspectives and experiences. Um, before we get started, just a couple of kind of housekeeping rules or uh, etiquette, Zoom etiquette. Um, the first is we're gonna be recording this. So if you'd rather not be on the recording, just turn your screen off um, and uh, you won't be on screen. Um, we will have time for question and answer a little bit later, but by all means, feel free to type questions in the chat. Um, we will, uh, again, answer those questions later. Uh, the format for today is sort of, we're going to do a, about 40 minutes or so of roundtable discussion with our presenters. We'll have a couple minutes for question and answers after that, and then we're going to break out into three breakout rooms where you'll get to choose which room you go to. Each room is going to be sort of moderated by one of our um, presenters today. So if you're interested in learning more about what they specifically are doing with their buildings or how they got to where they are, um, that'll be a good opportunity to join them there. So um, with that, I'd like to invite our presenters to maybe just say a few quick words about themselves, uh, about what building they have that they're kind of referring to today. I know not everybody's had a chance to necessarily visit your buildings like I've had the opportunity to do. Um, but yeah, so let's, let's go ahead and uh, we'll start with Will. Um, my name is Will Keyes. I'm the executive director of the Greenwich Land Trust. Um, our building uh, was a donation back in 2012. Um, after a capital campaign and extensive renovations, we moved into the facility um, in 2015. Um, I do put an asterisk next to this because then I came in in 2016. So um, I I'm quite uh, lucky to have kind of jumped into this situation after the construction, but um, was privy to a lot of conversations and uh, documentation of what went into this. Um, our facility is a four acre historic site in town. Um, it sits not in town, it sits kind of out, out of the town center somewhat and consists of a old farmhouse that's been converted into offices and office space. Um, we have a fully restored greenhouse. We have uh, an, a number of outbuildings that uh, we utilize for both program space as well as storage of stewardship materials. Uh, we have a large vegetable garden. We've converted most of the lawn back into native meadows. Um, we have a small parking area and all this was done um, obviously prior to me coming on board, but this was a residential rental um, property. So this had no really value for from a, a organizational standpoint. And prior to this, we were in rented space above a Domino's pizza. So quite a bit of a change. Um, and it has only lent itself in positive ways. Um, obviously, there's some and much financial consideration. Um, if you do hear any banging currently, the house is getting painted. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, just general maintenance and up, upkeep as any uh, facility would need. Great. Thanks, Will. Um, let's go to Mike. Mike Veeam, uh, Executive Director of Joshua's Tract Conservation and Historic Trust, also known as Joshua's Trust. Um, we have a number of buildings. We have a 1830s stone grist mill, um, which was the first building that the land trust took. It's the reason the land trust was actually founded in 1966 was to save this grist mill. With that came oh, about 20 acres and a um, 1830s Miller's house. And in 2015, we moved into a property that was bequeathed to us in 2013. It's the Atwood Farm. Uh, it's an 1838 farmhouse with 12 outbuildings on 68 acres. So we have a lot of uh, building issues that we've had some good experience with and some bad experience with. Um, we also have on a property on which the house was taken down at the time of the donation, a 
oh, the three bay workshop garage and sort of lean to uh, it's one of those properties that gets forgotten or at least buildings that gets forgotten because it is not near the headquarters. Uh, and that's the count so far. And anybody wants to know about old buildings, we've got a bunch of experience. We have also had properties over the years donated to us uh, with the permission to sell the houses um, to provide funding to the land trust. So we've had quite a bit of experience basically holding real estate, waiting for tenants to leave, getting rid of real estate, and happy to share it. Excellent. And Christina? Uh, I'm Christina White. I'm the executive director of the Lime Land Trust. Uh, we have been in the process for five years of trying to build a building. And it happens that this week, yesterday, we finally broke ground. So got the building permit officially on Monday, broke the ground on um, yesterday. So uh, we went through, I'm, I'm, I'm here to talk about the process because um, obviously it was a long one. It was five years of the process before we finally are actually here to build this building. Um, and the I'm happy to, I'm here to really to talk about the evolution of the process and where we started and where we are now. So uh, we're really excited um, and it's going to be, I can show you drawings of that um, later, but it's, um, it's going to be, Half of it is a stewardship barn for all of our equipment. And then the other half is offices and uh, meeting space. Excellent. And so I kind of want to start off uh, talking about the different opportunities that either you expect with, with the construction of the new building or the opportunities that have been created by moving into uh, the headquarters or office space or whatever it might be. So maybe, Christina, if we can start with you, um, what were some of the, the drivers behind this and the, the thinking that went in over those last five years about um, the need for and the benefits that might arise from building your, your headquarters? So um, the biggest issue, the driving force of this was really that we needed a place to put equipment for stewarding our properties. So um, we are managing over 3000 acres um, and we have, um, I'm trying to think, oh, this is always where 120 properties that we manage because, so that's a split between stewardship of uh, easements as well as fee properties. Um, but we also have been, well, there's throughout the years we've been uh, offered I... equipment. Um, we've been offered equipment and um, we had no place to put it because no one really wants to have it in their backyard. And we're really at a point now where we had to purchase certain things in order for us to continue. And finally, it was the stewardship committee finally went to the board um, and said, enough's enough. It's not fair to expect uh, board members to have all this equipment in their backyard. Um, and it was also really at a point where um, we had people saying, well, why don't you build a building partially? We also happened to, it was sort of a, where it all began was that there was a, a donor who wanted to buy a property and give it to us and um, allow us to build this, have a building and education center. Um, it all happened at the same time. The other piece was that um, I don't mind working in my, I've been working in, an, in my home office behind me here um, <laughs> for over 15 years with other jobs that I've done. So I, I love my office here, but um, my uh, coworker, environmental director um, works in this closet. Years with other jobs. Uh, my, uh, works in her closet basically. And so um, I basically was like, we can't have you live working in your closet. And we also just went to the board and basically said, this is not sustainable. You can't expect that when we hire an environmental director or executive director that they have a space in their house or that they're willing to have to work in their house and they could be super qualified. So it really was sort of a combination of we can't keep doing it the way we've been doing it and we need space. And so that's, that's where we ended up uh, the beginnings of this five year, five year journey. <laughs> Excellent. 
Excellent. And have have the the plans that you've created for this building? Obviously, it's not it's it's just starting to actually be built. But um, what what sort of factors did you include about sort of flexibility of the space in case uh, the organization right. grows or you have different yeah different needs? Well, let's put it this way: um, there was five years of discussions of needs and wants. And that slowly from where we started to where we are now is dramatically different. Mm -hmm. um, and basically what we're building now is what we need right now. Um, and actually I had to compromise a lot because of cost. Mm -hmm. This building is gonna cost a million dollars. And when I show you the plans, you're going to be like, you have to be nuts that that's the case. But it is. So due to inflation, um, if we could have built this building five years ago, it probably it would be so much less. But we are where we are. Um, and so we are we 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 went around and around and around. I mean, we went from two floors to one floor. Um, we went from um, a large, large meeting education space to now it's really a meeting room to three offices to two offices to I mean it's just we had a there was a lot that we just said okay you know and part of it was how you know looking at this towards the community I mean when we talked to when people understand if people building a building they know how much it's going to cost and it's really expensive the community at large, if we said, by the way, we're building this building and it's going to cost $2 million, they're like, that would have been so not okay. So, um, and even a million dollars and just putting a little asterisk next to this too. It's a commercial building. It's not, it is not, it has to be built commercial code. It could not be built like your house. Mm -hmm. That itself adds so much more money to the bottom line than it would have been if you know it, it was a house somewhere so mm -hmm. uh, and it has to do with the regulations within the town so um so that's really yeah that's where we are so am i do i love the building it's fine <laughs> it hasn't been built yet you have to give it a chance right <laughs> well I, I know where we're going right now and it literally we're going to move in and it's going to be too small mm -hmm. and that's just the way it is and uh, I I kind of look at it as we have space available upstairs and that'll be someone else's problem because I won't be around that <laughs> for that issue but it really was down to that we had to do that and that and that's a shame but um we're, we're, I mean, I, I, I shouldn't say that. I mean, I sound so pessimistic, but, you know, I'm talking to other fellow executive directors that understand the situation where um, it is, it's going to be great for us today. And, but we're going to grow out of it in, in a year or two. So. Um, well, let's, uh, let's go to, to Will, because I know that their, um, their building, as you mentioned, kind of has a lot of different facilities. So I'm curious, Will, if you can talk about sort of how it's expanded your programmatic areas of your land trust beyond just a, maybe a place for office space, but some of the other ways that the property gets used and, and how the different buildings and the greenhouse lend themselves to different programs or the creation of new ones. Right. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, sorry, I had to jump off my something. I don't know. I was having technical difficulties, so I'm on my phone now. Um, so, I mean, it's allowed us to do so much more. I mean, from just holding board meetings and having a full board, being able to meet under one roof um, and not using community space um, has been, uh, you know, just to, just to start with has been wonderful. Um, you know, it really gives us an identity. We're on a very prominent corner next to a service station, a volunteer firehouse, um, a little general store. So it gives us a lot of visibility within the community um, and kind of puts us on the map. Um, but from a programmatic standpoint, I mean, from uh, fundraising, we hold a big fundraiser here, which is great instead of having to utilize either rented space or somebody's home or uh, another facility. Um, having that kind of flexibility here is um, 
it's been a, a huge benefit for this organization. Um, programmatic, I mean, we have kind of, uh, the properties obviously evolved from more of a residential setting um, with lawns and, um, you know, more traditional space in that sense to much more of a natural landscape. So we have bees, we have um, about one and a half acres of native meadows. So we just had a, a, a quick, um, um, you know, program about uh, seed collecting and pollinators. And that was all done on our site. Um, we can house people, um, uh, not house them, we can park people on site um, and have uh, up to 40 cars um, through some creative <laughs> parking situations. Um, we also have an antique greenhouse that we restored. And, um, you know, when I first got here, uh, it was very underutilized. It cost about between eight and $10,000 a year to heat. It's a beautiful greenhouse, but it's not the most efficient greenhouse. It's a single pane 1940s Lord and Barnum greenhouse. Uh, we put in all new uh, mechanicals. So it functions great. It's just not the most efficient. So we created a program called Seed to Seed um, that has kind of become a signature program for us where we propagate native plants. We have a plant sale, we use them in restoration projects, we uh, do community engagement um, with other organizations and schools. Last year we grew 7,000 native plants. Um, we did that all because we have a greenhouse and how best to utilize that greenhouse. Um, in addition to that, we have a pretty large vegetable garden and we run a, a, a youth employment program in the summertime and all the produce uh, that's from the vegetable garden goes to the local food bank. So it's a great way for local kids to come in. It's their first job. Uh, they do a variety of different projects and work on other properties. But one of the things they do is work on our vegetable garden and that's on site as well. And uh, kind of piggybacking on that is, is the volunteer opportunities. So we've been able to engage a large number of volunteers, anywhere from, you know, individuals who want to just kind of get out in their community and, and work in a beautiful setting to, we work with um, a group here in town that services a large community of folks with different disabilities. And they come up and they volunteer here two days a week. Uh, high school kids, interns, um, you, you name it, we can now have a facility that's not just office space um, to engage a lot of people. And that has shown both in the success of our programmatic pieces, but also in fundraising and just the growth of the organization that we're able to engage large numbers of people, even if we're not making a ton of money on an individual program, if you're just kind of breaking even, all of a sudden now you have 40 people who have never visited the land trust, who have never been engaged by us, um, you know, we can collect their, their data and their information and be able to solicit them in a whole variety of different ways, both financially, but also plug them into um, uh, volunteer opportunities or board leadership opportunities. So um, for us, it's really put us in that next level. Um, not, not to mention, we do a lot of, stu of our own stewardship on our properties. And to be able to have outbuildings to, we have a tractor, we have a wood chipper, we have tools, all those things. Now we can um, house them on site under one roof, maintain them, uh, which is always important. Um, so it, it's really, you know, kind of propelled us to a whole different atmosphere. Terrific. And, and Mike, sort of similar question in terms of programmatic use, but maybe I, I know you also have sort of a, a caretaker model. That's a, another opportunity that was sort of created through the buildings. Um, yeah, if you want to just touch on sort of the different ways that you, you have a lot of buildings, so how yes. they maybe have different uses. Yeah, we do. So uh, the stone grist mills on the Fenton River in a fairly secluded part of town, even though it's, it's not far from the center. So other than the Miller's house, there's really no other structure in sight in any direction. So that used to be a problem um, when the mill first came to the trust because it was prone to vandalism. It was out of sight. 
um, what we've wound up doing over the decades is actually install a caretaker tenant in the Miller's house who has part-time obligations in season to basically be a backup docent for the mill. It's open on Sunday afternoons, May through October. Um, so it's, there's somebody there, there's a physical presence, there's somebody keeping an eye on things. Um, in exchange for that, they get a reduced rent. Um, they are basically serving the, the purpose of the trust by assisting in its, its historical interpretation to the public. Uh, similarly, at the Atwood Farm, uh, the property actually came with a caretaker. One of the wings of the house is an apartment. Uh, it was originally set up by the donor of the property in case she needed a living caretaker as she got older. She, she died at an advanced age, born in, and died in this house. Um, that caretaker also gets a reduced rent and is basically essential to the care of, of the five acres that's, that's landscaped and manicured around the actual house and outbuildings. Uh, the rest of the 60 acres or so is, is farmland that's being occupied by uh, one of our local farmers who keeps dairy cows on it. Um, we have similar arrangements on other properties with basically barter arrangements with farmers who maintain hay fields on our properties. Um, having the Atwood farm has given us outbuildings that are being used. Um, it was the donors wish that they be kept up and maintained uh, to be representative of a 19th century farm um, and farm life. So it's a, it's a very part-time farm museum. It's open three, typically three times a year, um, sometimes four. And because we have the grist mill and we have the Atwood farm, you're drawing people who are not necessarily traditionally drawn to a land conservation organization. So it does help us engage different communities, new communities. Um, we have managed to sneak tool storage into some of the buildings here because um, what's happened, this used to be a all volunteer organization, mostly people who were retired and what we've transitioned to over the last eight years or so is because we have storage space, we've been able to get donated tools like a hundred loppers at a time, shovels, rakes. Uh, and we have very much increased our engagement of Eastern Connecticut State University and the University of Connecticut. We're in the shadow of both. Um, and it's been to our advantage that the schools actually now mandate community service hours for graduation and the sports teams as well. Uh, so we've, we're getting currently about 250 to 300 students per semester. Um, we've gotten very good at fast turnaround on putting together volunteer hours for students who need at the last minute to graduate <laughs> another 10 hours of volunteer time. Uh, we've done some work uh, with court mandated community service people um, that's been hit or miss. Um, but you know, by having this facility and being close to the schools, we've been able to ramp up the volunteer work on our stewardship of our properties. We have, uh, we're up to 5,000 acres now, about 3,000 that we own outright. The rest is conservation easements. And for reasons peculiar to the, the start of this organization, we managed to accept a number of conservation easement properties that require affirmative maintenance by us, uh, which gets very interesting as ownership changes over the years. Um, but yeah, it's just we are we are we have broadened our visibility and um, engagement with our community because of having uh, the Atwood Farm in particular. We host regional gatherings because uh, we have a fairly large living room um, that can accommodate you know if you push it twenty people, twenty two people, uh, and we have parking for that. So you know it's it's definitely been challenging to have so many buildings to take care of, but it has just opened up all kinds of new options for us in terms of what we do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. And I, and I think that's a good segue is, I mean, these buildings do create lots of opportunities and new, new, yeah, just really opens doors in, in a sense, both, I guess, literally and metaphorically. Um, but with these buildings, obviously, it does come the challenge of managing upkeep and administration and use and uh, additional insurance and things like that. So um, I don't know, Mike, maybe, maybe we can stay with you and then we'll kind of circle back. But um, how, how are you guys managing some of those challenges, especially with what is a more sort of complex portfolio of, of buildings um, in terms of sort of budgeting and planning out uh, upkeep and maintenance and uh, yeah. Um, it's, it's been interesting. Um, you know, one of the problems back when the grist mill became part of our portfolio is the building was fairly sound 
Um, it had been basically an operating mill up until 1940 when a critical part broke and they simply seized operation and became storage. So all the original equipment's intact. Uh, so for the first 25 years or 30 years that we owned it, really not much had to be done except the coat of paint here and there, replace a cedar roof, three point windows, all of which was done by volunteers who at that time were much younger. Um, what we noticed, oh, it's about six years ago now, um, is one of the stone walls of the grist mill was beginning to bulge out. Uh, not, not a good thing for stone mills. And we wound up spending the first serious money on it. We had to get a condition assessment with a uh, engineering, structural engineering firm, had to work up work plans for it, had to do phases of work. Um, that wound up, I was just looking back this morning, the assessment alone costs 30 some thousand dollars. And then we've been spending multiples of that ever since on, on projects to basically stabilize the building. We're, we're in a fairly good place right now in terms of, I'm back to like window maintenance and the roof is scheduled for next year. Um, we've had the added interesting problem of the mill is of course on a river and the river has been eroding thanks to climate change and increased storm runoff. And we've been working with the National Trout Unlimited and the local chapter of Trout Unlimited on actually doing riverbank restoration to help protect the mill from getting undermined. Um, not something I expected to be working on, but it goes with the territory. Uh, the Atwood farm, we wound up um, also getting an architect and an engineering firm to do a conditions assessment. Um, basically you get 140 page, 150 page report that documents the current conditions and gives recommendations for things that need to be restored, rehabilitated, improved. Um, the work is prioritized, cost estimating is done. Um, a little warning about the cost estimating, don't believe it. <laughs> I buy three at least. Um, and in the case of going back to the grist mill, we had some grant support from the 1772 foundation and from other foundations. And the problem with that is not only that you have to do the grant reporting, but we were required to do things like have a supervising engineer sign off on the work that was being done by the general contractors, which adds basically oversight fees that were not in the initial estimates. So um, not a whole lot of forecasting on these expenses because we kind of went in with no like prior history of doing this work. Um, what we've done since is basically just kept a track on annual what we call routine expenses to do our budgeting for future years. Uh, in terms of where the money comes from, the Atwood property came to us fortunately with a mm, roughly two and a half million dollar bequest, um, which helps a lot. And uh, the, the donor was actually an antique dealer, well-known antique dealer for her entire life. Um, and the house came complete with contents that were auctioned off and that money actually covered the, the ongoing maintenance and getting started costs for the first four years that we were here. Mm -hmm. um, so that gave a chance for the endowment to build up to something over $3 million now. Um, the property that I mentioned with the garage that's not near us, uh, where the house was torn down, that property came with a million and a half dollar endowment, which has helped. Uh, the grist mill has been historically underfunded because at the time that it was first accepted by the trust, you know, a very generous person gave it an endowment of $40,000. And at the time, that was more than enough in terms of what it generated in income to cover the minor costs. And um, so basically what the trust has had to go out for other fundraising and dip into its own monies to support the more expensive work that's happened at the grist mill. A uh, cautionary note to anybody that has something like our situation with a Miller's house that's not near the headquarters and has a tenant and is pretty self-contained is it's amazing how 20 years go by and you suddenly find out that like the back wall of the building is completely rotted out of the foundation and there's major structural work that needed that nobody had anticipated because nobody had gone into the building in years. So now we go in every year, two years and assess and so forth. But yeah, despite what sounds like a variety of problems and headaches to deal with, uh, the overall has been, it's been great to have the buildings just in terms of visibility and program flexibility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one, one thing on the fundraising side, though, speaking from the perspective of my development person, uh, 
it's kind of hard to extract money from people to support a building. They would prefer to like fund something like land acquisition or education. Um, so it, it, it's, it's just, it's a challenge to be aware of if you're going in, but like, where's that money coming from? And yeah, and it depends. Yeah, the, this land trust also had a very long history of, of basically going it alone and, and being very happy about like, oh, we don't need money. We do everything with volunteers. People contribute if there is any need. It's all from within the group. And that just, it doesn't work in this day and age. So we do now go out to a broader community that's usually willing to support the conservation mission less so than the overhead. Uh, things to keep in mind. Yeah, yeah. And, and maybe, Will, if we could, build on that a little bit in terms of like uh, what what additional staff capacity you find um, needed to, obviously the building support programs in one way, but the, the buildings <laughs> need a little bit of support themselves. Um, so in terms of like staff capacity and upkeep, um, but also maybe from like an administrative standpoint. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it. Um, you know, it, it's an old house. So I think like Michael said, you know, it, it takes a lot of um, just maintenance. You don't want to defer any maintenance. So we're always making sure that all of our systems, whether it's our HVAC, our computer systems, our alarm systems, all the things that go into kind of a modern building are all maintained uh, septic systems. Um, we try to do some of it on our own. Um, I mean, there's four, four, four of us here that own our own homes that, you know, if we can try to do something or we have a volunteer group to repaint a front porch, um, but with all the other conflicting, you know, time commitments, it, it, that can be a challenge. Um, we rely on our staff mostly and our volunteers for kind of outdoor, we'll call it landscaping or land stewardship or land management pieces, um, leaving much of the, you know, painting and roofing and all that to the professionals. Um, so far since we, I've been here, we've had to, you know, replace new roofs on barns. We are currently painting our main facility here. Um, and I got a really good quote, but it was $25,000. Um, now you can, we budget that, uh, through a capital budget. Um, but it's never an easy number to, to swallow, especially as, as things get more pricey. Mm -hmm. Uh, like I said, we, you know, it's an old facility, but we did a, a big renovation and capital campaign between 2012 and 2014 say. So, there are a lot of things are new, uh, which is wonderful to, to have kind of new furnace and new, you know, uh, AV equipment and all of that. There's not cords running all through the place. It was a gut job and interior and all of that was, was put in, um, you know, it, I mean, so I hope I answered your question, but it, you know, we, we kind of rely on, on making sure that we, maintain the facility through contracts of for service and, and such so that we don't get behind on certain things mm -hmm. but funding is 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 always you know kind of a it's not a challenge but it's always something to think about when you under when, when you have a facility or a building or a program or you know everything from you know it was really a, obviously we all know it was really warm this this summer um our our electric bills for our east HVAC were over $600 um, and propane for the, for the greenhouse. I, I don't even know what that's going to be this year. Um, so we have those pieces that we need to plan for. When I came in, there was just one line item on a budget that just said the Mueller preserve. Um, and I've broken that down to be utilities and uh, snow plowing, you know, all the things now that it takes to run a facility. Um, and, and I mean, can you maybe just quickly, it doesn't have to be a comprehensive list, but some of those costs that maybe you didn't either didn't consider at first or, or like might be a surprise for folks who are thinking about getting into building that yeah, like snow plowing is probably not something. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I you know, it's funny. I, I, I kind of run it like a house, you know, and like, you, you know, at least in, in my own personal house, you know, we, you know, yeah, you, you kind of have to think about all these little, little things cause they all do add up, but things like snow plowing, uh, getting the grass mode, you know, do I have staff that does that or do we contract that out? Those are decisions that we have to make based on all the other needs of the organization. 
um, you know, it is somewhat of a challenge to, you know, say, okay, well, hey guys, we're not going to mow our conservation properties. We're going to mow the front yard today. That doesn't always go over well. So it's just easier to contract it out. It's actually, you know, then we don't need the big mowers and all those certain things. Um, I, again, I can't stress enough just kind of service contracts and, you know, all of the, the, the different um, uh, components here from HVA systems to oil burners to we have a, an old house with a, with a, with a masonry foundation. So uh, some pumps and making sure all those sump pumps are have backup batteries and all that, because um, you know, it can be a challenge. Uh, we had a frozen pipe not too long ago. Um, so making sure that that was handled correctly. Um, I, I think, you know, one thing to stress here is, you know, much of what three of us are saying, you know, shouldn't, almost deter anybody we're just putting out the red flags again i think that this organization is is a hundred percent better because of the facilities we have there's just many different hats you have to wear as an executive director or board president to make sure that the facility is is up and running um you know, prior to being at the land trust, I, I was at a, a larger facility, a large nonprofit that had a gate entry and people paid and they came in. And it's always the first impression, you know, if, the, if, the, if our grass is six inches high and the, and the beds are not weeded and the, you know, you, you name it, that's the first impression, a visitor, a donor, a volunteer, a board, whoever it is comes in. Um, that's what they see. It, in, instead of having you know, beautiful window boxes that are, are planted and, uh, you know, a, a facility that's cleaned regularly. I mean, we do have a cleaning crew that comes in here every two weeks and just like a normal house cleans the bathrooms and cleans the floors and all those things um, that you would want any guest to a house, whether it's your own or, or the facility here um, to, to kind of appreciate. So I think, aesthetics are really important, at least from our standpoint. Um, it's kind of that first impression. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that's my opinion, but I, I, I think that it goes a long way. Um, I mean, we've all been to organizations where you kind of scratch your head and like, uh, it, you know, do we, do we want to be a part of those organizations that, um, you know, might not be able to, you know, take out the trash every day or whatever it is versus, yeah. you know, yeah. Yeah, and, and we talked a little bit about how having a space like this has also provided space to meet with some of your bigger donors and, and kind of that, that first impression and that, that professionalism and um, having that, that home base that, that you're proud of um, can really add to the donor's experience interacting with, with the land trust and potentially lead to, to gifts or, or support. Um, we have a big fundraiser here in June called uh, evening at the farmstead. We have 350 people. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's a rather large event, but those are 350 of some of the largest donors we have. They get to come here and this place is spruced up. We've spent a week preparing for it. We've cleaned out our barns. There's long dining tables and bars and food stations in these barns. And, it's elegant with a very rustic flair to it and people just love it. And I think that is a perfect example where bringing people to a site kind of excites people about the organization and, and we're able then to um, use that to be able to uh, seek additional gifts or, or other opportunities. So again, I, I think, and that's just a large program that those has nothing to do with the, the small programs that we offer as well. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. And Christina, uh, you, you touched on this a little bit in terms of like uh, almost how much is too much to spend on a project like this. I'm, I'm curious if you, what, if, if you've had any pushback about, I don't know if, if, if building something like this is too far away from sort of the, the core mission or the, um, I don't know if, if you've had supporters who have raised concerns about, uh, yeah, kind of what, what the focus of the land trust is, if this is taking capacity away from conservation projects and how you might have addressed any of those concerns. Um, so I would like to also acknowledge that we have the architect designed the building so that um, we could um, build out the second floor 
and there's space on the lot to add space. Um, the other part that I didn't mention is that um, it's kind of weird, Will, because literally there's a volunteer fire department down the road and a little general store and we're at a crossroads. So it's sort of like <laughs> the same. The coolest part is it's across the street from our education preserve. It's sort of what we consider our education preserve. So that in itself is ideal. And that was the real catalyst for why we got the property. And the other big piece that I did not mention is that we were given the property. So we didn't have to pay for it. Mm. Um, and it's it was one of the last commercial lots in the town of Lyme. So we were able to kind of hit a lot of things at the same time. Commercial build, it's already been it's already commercially zoned. Um, we didn't have to pop, we didn't have to pay for the land. Um, so that all in itself was like, oh my God, this is a perfect location for what we're going to do. Um, just to just to chime in really quick, we our property was donated to, but we had to get it rezoned um, mm -hmm. because it's in a residential zone right now. It's a uh, the the and we had to get a special designation. Uh, um, in order for us to have this facility. And we're also limited to things like the number of events we can do. Uh, we can't rent it out for weddings. This was all part of the zoning um, pieces. So, you know, we can't do weddings. We can do our own. And I, I don't want to steal your thunder, Christina. But, um, no, 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 no. I think this is a really important piece to talk about is, is planning and zoning. And I see a question right. about it. Too, is that... Um, I'm on the planning and zoning commission. So I kind of knew beforehand, like, oh, we can't do this. We can't do that. And even though um, for a rural to build in a rural zone, which is what we call it here, housing rural zone, um, it mentioned like churches and other things, but not nonprofits. So we would have to change the regulations specifically for uh, the land trust in order to, to build on a rural lot. And so the planning and zoning was like, just so you know, we are not going to approve that, find some commercial land. So all of that being said is like, it ended up being the spot was perfect. So um, go ahead, Will, if you wanted to finish. Oh, that, I, so. I, very similar. You know, I think we had, we kind of had to, you know, we found a very, like almost like a loophole. You know, we're not an industrial site. We're not a commercial site. Um, I think our designation is... Um, like horti a horticultural center and, you know, wildlife center or something like that, that um, is a designation that allows us to have this type of facility. You know, like when we, they, when we did the renovation, we don't have a full kitchen. We have a, a kitchenette, which is basically everything but a stove. Um, so we can't obviously have, um, you know, we can't rent it out for any of those purposes. We can't put a catering kitchen in here. Um, like I was saying, we can't rent it out unless we can't have events unless they're land trust sponsored events. In, then that would be including weddings and such like that. With that said, the planning and zoning commission and then the folks that I know there have said, well, now that you know everyone knows who you are, maybe you go in for uh, an amendment to that to say, can we do one to three a year? Um, and, and maybe they'd be more comfortable with that, knowing that, that, you know, who we are now and, and what they have. So that doesn't preclude you from making changes eventually to the facility. Um, yeah. And I, and I now don't even remember where we started. Aaron was the question. Oh, oh you were asking. Just thinking about like capacity and, and taking away from, yeah. yeah. Um, so actually what happened was um, uh, we had um, prior this sort of started actually, I, I became um, executive director in 2017. And then in 2018, uh, in January, we had a strategic planning meeting. And um, one of the things on that strategic plan was to put in, a, to have a building, to have an office. And it was really because um, we are, the our land trust is really at a, a stage where we, we want to do the next step. We're ready for that next step. We're ready to take on, um, you know, we feel like we have everything sort of is going well everywhere else. But if we really want to look at, do we want to have um, more impact in our community? Do we want to have more impact regionally? Um, we need, we're like, well, we need space. We need space for that. Um, and it was sort of like, we just kept, we were in a floating, we were floating around like, like just sort of status quo. And we really 
and I felt this immediately when I became ED was that we're not going to be able to really do anything beyond what we're doing now if we didn't have a building because um as I think Will mentioned, um, I'm super excited to have a board, a place to have a meeting where I'm not meeting at the coffee shop or someone's house or my house or the library or wherever is to be able to have a meeting space for the board, for our committees, um, to have people come to visit where we can have a chat. Um, that in itself is going to be huge. Um, and I think you asked about whether, um, was it part so it was part of our strategic plan one um now every single board member had a different vision in their head of what that meant so my job along with fortunately the president who and i were both on the same page was if we're going to do this we're going to do this properly and not just sort of have this tiny little shack saying and put a sign up saying lime land trust so um the other thing that we also did and we made a point of doing as soon as we decided that this was going to happen was that um, we made it very clear to our members and the community that no money that we had already was going to go to this project. We were going to raise money and the only money that we're going to use is the money that people actually said, this is for your building. Mm -hmm. So because we had a lot of pushback. We're like, you know, saying people thought that we were just going to start using all the money that we already had to build this building. And we said, no, 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 we are going to raise this and it's going to be designated for that. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't. So then once that was said, um, no one really had any more pushback on that. So, um, and fortunately we have raised, even we haven't even, haven't, we haven't even gone out and actually, officially started raising money for this building and we have the money to build it from donors who just said just from us talking to people they said we're going to give you the money so um i think that answers your question sorry yeah, yeah. I went like this a little bit no but... that was great yeah um excellent well i just mindful of the time i also want to be able to address some of the questions that have come up in the chat um we talked a little bit about the um planning and zoning process um John was curious about uh, Will in, in Greenwich. Would was it a particularly difficult process, or uh, just uh, what 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 was involved in that? Maybe the time it's kind of or, yeah. kind of a loaded question with planning and zoning in Greenwich. Um, <laughs> <laughs> nothing's easy, um, but I think um, you know everybody realized the potential here and kind of who the players were and are. Um, you know, this was a donated property. What we were preserving was somewhat historic. The other option would be to sell this and build kind of your typical Greenwich four acre lot house um, on a very, very prominent corner. So planning and zoning definitely worked with the organization, but it wasn't easy. Um, you know, there's a lot of hoops and uh, to jump through and, you know, you got to have people that trust who you are and, and, and what what you do. So um, we were supported by kind of the town government, our select board, our select men. Um, obviously, our board of directors was, were very influential in that. So um, it, it, it's never really easy um, for something like this, but it wasn't hard mm -hmm. per se. Mm -hmm. um, Mike, I think this came up uh, when you were talking. Um, the does the town tax any of the properties that like your farmers are using or that that have these different i guess other than just strictly open space uses they actually don't um in the case of the two rental properties that generate rental income they're both in mansfield and the mansfield authorities were sympathetic um to the the concept of you know this person is getting this reduced rental arrangement in exchange for having affirmative obligations to maintain these local historic properties and participate in their oversight. Mm -hmm. um, in the case of farmers, this is, it's all done by barter and handshake. So there's no rental income coming across and we're in a very, you know, agrarian focused area, despite being right under the University of Connecticut and Eastern Connecticut State University. Most of the properties in our different towns are, you know, very in favor of maintaining active farming 
use. Um, so, mm -hmm. And in the case of Mansfield, when it comes to almost anything in dealing with the town government is because the trust started in Mansfield and has been involved here so deeply since 1966. It was founded actually by half of the Mansfield Historical Society and half of the Conservation Commission. Um, so we have lots of former trustees who are embedded in the various commissions and they, are, they tend to be favorably disposed towards us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's just, you know, because of who we are and where we are and the nature of our relationships. We have, we have a pretty strong cooperative arrangement with all the 14 towns, um, you know, in terms of we have conver conversations with planning and zoning and with conservation commissions and sort of agree, okay, that's a property that, you know, they'll support Joshua's Trust going after that one, or we'll have properties that we refer to the various towns because it just seems to make better sense as a town property. Um, it helps to have, you know, a pretty active network of friends in town government out here. Yeah, yeah. I would say the same for me, for like, you know, one of the things that's been great for us, the land trust from right from the beginning is we have a very close relationship with the town government. Mm -hmm. And um, they're actually the, the former first selectman is the one that told us about the property and said, you might want to look into that. So he's the one that kind of said, check out, give this person a call. I bet you they'll give it to you. Um, and then the same with planning and zoning. Have, I mean, I'm on the board, but also just saying they, we work, they talk to us prior to us doing anything like just saying, this is what we, you should be looking for. We don't think we're going to support this, but we'll, you know, but then once we got this going, it was a piece of cake as far as the, uh, and the town waived all of our permit fees, which is over $10,000 or something like that. So. Mm -hmm. uh, just to, pit, to jump on that, we do not pay property taxes on our facility here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and we, also we, for we actually pay time. like a sewer hookup line on, on some of our other properties. It's a sewer hookup line fee. That's about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we and we we have um, a couple farmers that do um, lease our land, but they lease it for free. I guess mm -hmm. we have an agreement that there's no money being transferred, so we don't get charged. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On that note, uh, we do have one, we have a living estate. So somebody lives in the property that they've donated um, and that we do, we pay the property taxes on that. That's part of the deal. So that is still taxed. Um, Sorry, can you repeat that, Will? So uh, one of our properties, this is not the property that we're currently uh have our offices in, but another conservation property is a living estate. So they've donated, it's a little complicated, but they've donated the, the property, but they have the right to live there through, as long as they're the, the resident, that property is still taxed um, by the town, but the agreement is that we, the land trust pays the property taxes on it. This is a, a property that was done in 1999 the project, so. Um, so in a sense, we're, we're, we're paying for the property because if you look at the property taxes since 1999, it's, it, it does add up after a while. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Got it. Thank you. Um, really quickly, just this last question. I know this, we could probably have a whole nother webinar on this, but um, Madeline asked about solar panels and arrays. I, I want to expand that a little bit just to think about um, we did address that question certainly, but any other sort of sustainability considerations you've had with your building, whether it be installing an EV charger or Christina, I, I'm not, I, I'm sure this is too small a project for something like LEED certification, but uh, mm -hmm. maybe what types of materials or insulation levels or things you're considering? Yeah, so um, we actually went through um, a lot, there was so much discussion on that and so it's a small building and we're actually heat it's a the heating and cooling area part of the building is so small that we actually going to use splits because it's going to be the most economical and the least impact so to speak um and that means we don't have to have a basement which was a big deal um but we're also going to do sort of phases so currently we have plans to do solar array because of the way the building is built we can do that we just aren't going to do it right away because again the costs are so much for this commercial building um we plan on doing it but we need to we 
I, th I think um, there is a source that would probably provide the it pay for that. Um, but we just can't, it's, it was mostly, we decided that it would just wasn't worth it doing it all at once. Um, but we are using materials that are environmentally, um, like what's the word, you know, nice. <laughs> what's that's not the word, but you know what I mean. Um, and, uh, but we also, the, unfortunately, one of the things that we really did have to take into account because of the way inflation is right now is cost. So sometimes it was like really as much as we wanted to say, oh, this is going to be this, you know, lead building and all that. It's too expensive for what, for this tiny little thing that we're doing. Um, and so we just felt like we had to kind of say, okay, you know, can we, do we want to do that and spend another few hundred thousand dollars um, versus getting this building built at a um, reasonable cost and then start going from there. Um, I, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, some of the things that we are like, we, we are planning on doing right away is that the whole land, all the whole landscape will be an educational landscape. So we'll be a pol It's going to be, there'll be, a, it'll be pollinator garden, but it's also a whole, it's in a gravel pit, gravel and sand. And our intent is to show what you can grow in gravel and sand and create a diverse, um, we already know that we have like six or seven endangered species that live there already that are, uh, you know, turtles and snakes and invertebrates and stuff. So the point is that we're not going to change that. We're going to work with what we have. And so that in itself is not, and then we already have a whole crew that wants to volunteer. Like, so that the whole outside will be um, environmentally friendly. And I think as far as working on solar panels and other things, that'll come along as we go. But again, the space that is being heating and cooled compared to the whole building is so small, the environmental impact is not gonna be a huge thing anyway. So mm -hmm. that was sort of how we kind of looked at it as, you know, do we really want to spend all this money for something that isn't, it's not a very big building. Yeah. And I think those are things we have to look at. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, like, our, our, one, our, one minute uh, quickly each, um, and then I do want to get to those breakout rooms. So, um, yeah, some, some. Ours, just on adding to that, you know, when we did the renovation, um, you know, many different zones were put in. So heating and cooling could be utilized by different areas in the building. Um, it was obviously um, closed cell foam was blown into all the walls. Um, every, all the efficiencies for, you know, new technology from um, heat pumps and such were utilized to heat and cool the building. Uh, but it is an old building. So, you know, if you want the character of the old building, there are some things that are, are somewhat of a challenge. Um, but for the most part, everything that could be done was done. We are looking at a, an electrical upgrade to one of our barns and we hope to install uh, solar panels on the roof during that upgrade. So um, there is room for some um, you know, sustainable uh, pieces to this as well. Mike, any last thoughts on this? Uh, yes, the mention of the electric vehicle charging. I will warn people who start hiring a younger staff that they sort of expect that kind of thing. Um, I have a, my most recent hire drives an electric vehicle and we've had some discussions about it. Um, at this location, I've tried to encourage the board to think about geothermal, um, but the cost has been a obstacle. And in terms of solar, um, all of our buildings are either in historic districts, which have rules or are on the state or the town historic register or both. Um, and there is in this area, any of the historic districts, there's a lot of pushback against any solar installations that are visible from the road. So we have, we have not gone to any of the sources that we should like solar geothermal or <laughs> electric vehicles, but the day hopefully will come. Excellent. And just to um, build on this a little further, we are hoping to have a workshop on this sort of topic, sort of sustainability within your organization at our conference in March, March 25th. So keep an eye out for that. Um, 
And yeah, so I, I just want to say a quick word of thanks to uh, Will, Mike, and Christina for their thoughts. Um, you all will now have the opportunity, I'm going to press the button in a minute, to select a breakout room um, that will, uh, the Mike, Christina, and Will are going to kind of host each one of those. I'll, I'll pop in and out. But um, yeah, feel free to ask questions, build on those discussions. We kind of have themes for those breakout rooms. Um, not that you have to stick to that if everybody is interested in talking about something else. But um, the idea was that if you're interested in learning more about sort of the historic building side of things, you'd go with, with Mike. If you're interested in learning about sort of the different programmatic uses that uh, might arise from um, your, your building endeavors, uh, you'll go with Will. And if uh, you're learning or you're interested in learning about sort of new construction or projects from the ground up, you'll go with Christina. Um, so let me activate those. Great, looks like we're all back in the main room now. Um, so yeah, just wanted to kind of, we have 10 minutes or so left, give folks an opportunity to uh, ask any lingering questions or speak their minds if there's anything um, that that kind of came from your breakout room discussions or anything like that. Um, we've got a lot of experts in the room, both those who kind of presented, but there's also folks in the room who are involved with land trust that have buildings and didn't participate on the panel, not not by their choice. I just, it's, there's a lot of folks I could have invited to do this. Um, so yeah, any, any last questions or discussions or, yeah, we have a hand raised. Harvey, go ahead. Oh, I think you muted. Okay, that's better. Uh, there's a meeting two weeks from now uh, with your group, with the Preservation Connecticut group. Yep. Um, can I assume that's going to be a discussion of obtaining grants and moving forward with historic buildings? Yeah, so that's gonna be a much deeper dive into sort of historic buildings specifically. Part of it, we'll, we'll discuss funding opportunities. Um, we're also just gonna discuss everything from like different types of historic designations and restrictions and the organizations involved in sort of upholding some of those restrictions. So um, yeah, a bit more of a comprehensive deeper dive into historic buildings generally, and, and we'll have folks from Preservation Connecticut actually leading that discussion and they okay. are well tapped into funding opportunities as well. And then I actually look forward to that meeting. <laughs> Great. Okay, yeah. thank you. Of course, yeah. And of course, everyone else has invited the details for that are on our website. I'll, uh, I'll put them in the chat before the end too. But um, yeah, that's uh, two weeks from today, same time. Uh, Joan, go ahead. Yeah. Um we touched briefly on Christine's, um, Christina's explanation of the zoning requirements in the commercial area. Um, what is required of an existing house? Do we still have to put in sprinklers and an ADA compliant door? And uh, what kinds of things are basic to all of these buildings? There'll be, a, yeah, I presume a public, open to the public building. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, my so I, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert on this. My <laughs> hunch is that it's going to be a town by town thing, largely depending on your town specific zoning requirements. Um, I do believe that in terms of like ADA compliance and sprinklers and things like that, some of that applies only if it's a municipal building. Or so if it's a, a private building, it might not apply. When I was at our land trust, we were looking at purchasing a building that was previously owned by the town and had been brought up to all of those ADA standards. But as the new owners, we wouldn't necessarily have to continue to comply with them, though it was something we wanted to consider for accessibility reasons, but um, probably on a case by case basis. We had to install a uh, ADA compliant restroom as well as a wheelchair lift because there's uh, it's like, you know, it's on a porch. It's like a one and a half level up. So our town required us to go through some um, updates to be compliant. Here we had to get a zoning exception. We had to widen doors for ADA compliance. We had to install a handicap access ramp, handicap parking spaces, uh, and the full ADA compliant bathroom on the first floor. Uh, That's what we did too. 
Yeah, in turn, basically you'd want to talk with your building official and your fire marshal to see what specifics would apply to, to your building in your town. Because uh, it does, as Aaron says, it varies from town to town. And some of that might also be dependent on funding you get from different sources. That funding might come with requirements for accessibility or, or things like that. Uh, Julie. Thanks, Aaron. Um, I'm curious, we're, we're having, I'm from the Brantford Land Trust and we're having some conversations about potential collaborations with other um, non town nonprofits in um, managing and using a building. And I'm wondering if other, you know, how many other land trusts are looking at sort of sharing a building with other nonprofits. Um, and I'd love to hear any experience. And I know we're short on time, but maybe I could connect offline with somebody who has some experience doing that. Or maybe we're just the only ones. <laughs> I don't, it's I don't really, think or it's one. a really bad idea and so nobody's doing it. I don't know. <laughs> no and and again going back to the building i was looking at when I, I was at the land trust it was far more space than we needed at least initially and so we were looking at opportunities to sublet some space to other nonprofits in town and felt that nonprofit partnerships in the same building made more sense than loosening it to just some private for-profit business um i think there's there's plenty of economies of scale things that could work there too like shared tech and shared printing and things like that. At the CLCC headquarters, we share the space with um, a number of other environmental nonprofits and some of that comes with uh, some shared services. I think Amy's uh, maybe, I don't know, different question, but yeah, I'll, uh, that might be a good question to post on the, the listserv too, to see if there's other examples from folks that just aren't, aren't with us today. Okay, great. I uh, talked about that initially, um, working with the Eight Mile um, River scenic and watershed group. Um, and the, the only thing that comes, can, it makes it slightly complicated is, you know, uh, how just to separate the costs. You know, we talk, we started talking about it and it does, it can get a little complicated unless it becomes a 50-50 shot or something like that. And who's going to manage um, the lease agreements and who's going to manage the um, separation of the electric bill and all the bills and services that you're going to go through. We started doing that and then they ended up not, they couldn't wait any longer to come up with a space. So they ended up as Amy posted, she, um, they, they have a space now with, um, um, which I think it's in East Haddam, um, that they're sharing. Um, but we looked into that because we would, would have been happy to have done that, but it turned out it wouldn't have worked for us for them because they were they couldn't work anymore so yeah and i think we're not so much thinking about actually sharing a space but leasing one of our buildings to another nonprofit and then making mm -hmm. use of it so it's it's a slightly different situation hi christina hi julie's my cousin by the way so oh. <laughs> christina <Ross. Hi>. hi. <laughs> so aaron our our two buildings with tenants. One of them, it's a standalone 1830s house. So they take care of their own utilities for heating, oil, and electricity. In the case of the Atwood building, where we have a tenant in the one wing, uh, we actually, upon moving in here, separated the utilities. So he has his own meter um, and his apartment's actually electric heat. So it's, you know, he's covering all of his costs and doesn't in any way cover, you know, get any of the expenses of uh, the office here. Okay. Excellent. Well, it doesn't look like there's any other hands raised. Uh, any sort of final thoughts from our, our presenters? No? I, all I, because yeah. I'm still going through this is, because yeah. um, it took us five years, is patience, lots of therapy. <laughs> <laughs> But um, no, I, I think it's just knowing, like, just keeps knowing that you have someone on the board that's that agrees with you to be able to continually talk to each other and support each other, because it is it, you, you end up having board members leave and new board members come. But know that you really like know that you have this in your head. It will come to fruition. It don't ever don't think of something in your head that it's going to look like because it's not going to be what it turns out to be. And that's okay too, um, but it it's it, it'll happen. You just uh, it's just going to take a lot of time. I I didn't think it was going to take this long, and it took a long time. So, 
Excellent. Um, I'm just going to pull up the link for the uh, historic buildings webinar that we're doing in two weeks. So that's in the chat now. But um, yeah, thank you, Christina, Will, and Mike for taking the time to, to lead this presentation today. And thank you all for joining us. I hope you all got something out of this. And CLC is happy to be a resource if you have additional questions. We might not be able to answer all of them, but we can certainly point you in the right direction of uh, other land trusts who might have done something similar in the past. So um, thanks again and have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. If anybody wants to reach out, I'm happy to talk with others about historic buildings. So just reach me offline and uh, I'm here. Thanks, Mike. Take care.